What genre is David Foster Wallace? Well, that is a hard and complicated question to answer. So why not instead talk about the genre that David Foster Wallace invented himself? And today we're talking about the genre of new sincerity. And I'm sure that you've never heard of that before because it obviously didn't take off and reshape entertainment and literature forever. But in today's video, we're going to hear Wallace's vision of this new genre and what we need to do as writers to make it happen. And if you guys don't already know, Write Conscious is the headquarters of everything related to David Foster Wallace on YouTube. I already have a massive playlist of videos on Wallace down below, so click those and I will see you in another video after this one. So let us hear Wallace talk about new sincerity. Quote, the next real literary rebels in this country might well emerge as some weird bunch of anti-rebels, born oglers who dare to back away from ironic watching, who have the childish gall to actually endorse single entendre values, who treat old and trendy human troubles and emotions in US life with reverence and conviction. Who, who eschew self-consciousness and fatigue. These anti-rebels would be outdated, of course, before they even started, too sincere, clearly repressed, backward, quaint, naive, anachronistic. Maybe that will be the point. While they'll be the next real rebels, real rebe rebels, as far as I can see, risk things, risk disapproval. The old postmodern insurgents risk the gasp and squeal, shock, disgust, outrage, censorship, accusations of socialism, anarchism, nihilism. The new rebels might be the ones willing to risk the yawn, the rolled eyes, the cool smile, the nudged ribs, the parody of gifted ironess, the how banal, accusations of sentimentality, melodrama, credulity, willingness to be suckered by a world of lurkers and starters, excuse me, starers, who fear gaze and ridicule above imprisonment without law. Who knows? And when we look at Wallace's style, especially in Infinite Jest, this is what it feels like. And in a blog post in 2012, Michael Motes explores this idea further. Quote, the theory is this, Infinite Jest is Wallace's attempt to both manifest and dramatize a revolutionary fiction style that he called for in his essay, E. Unubis Plurum, television and U.S. fiction. The style is one in which a new sincerity will overturn the ironic detachment that hollowed out contemporary fiction towards the end of the 20th century. Wallace was trying to write an antidote to the cynicism that had pervaded and saddened so much of American culture in his lifetime. He was trying to create an entertainment that would get us talking again. So why was Wallace calling for this new literary genre of new sincerity? Well, we have to go back to the cynicism of the postmodernists to find out. Because when you look at the postmodernist era, what they were pushing back against were absolutist truths. Because they were existing in a reality where there were so many um, scandals and revelations coming from those that they wanted differing voices and opinions to be able to comment on what was going on. Because back in the late 60s, there were the French um, student protests, there was the Vietnam War, there was Watergate, the end of the Cold War, the Iran-Contra affair, you know, the list goes on. And with the public awakening of consciousness or the evolution of consciousness through the use of psychedelics and, you know, the whole free love movement, all these old truths, institutions, and ideals started to be questioned. And the way that postmodernists did this a lot of the time was through irony or through these um, cynical critiques of what was going on. But the problem with cynicism, the problem of fighting fire with fire, well, is, it's exactly that. You know, violence begets more violence. And it's actually a downward trend because if you guys have known any postmodernists, you know, I've was stuck at university for eight years and I knew so many guys in the humanities who were the little sad boys. They were, you know, they'd call everyone a fascist and they'd uh, make sure the language was correct and never, never say or do anything wrong. And they had their uh, Derrida, Foucault, and all those guys under their arm. And almost every single one of them was depressed or on antidepressants or like had so many problems and so much trauma. Because living in that cynicism, being a deconstructionist who's always just projecting hate toward everything, everything's wrong with society, you know, it's capitalism and these people's fault and these people's fault and it never ends, eventually you're going to start tearing yourself apart in that process. And we've obviously today had a postmodernist revival in the attitudes of a lot of people in this country. A lot of people are very cynical and bitter and there's irony and a lot of name calling being thrown around. And what happened in the 60s or kind of after the 60s and what's happening now is that the backlash of that is kind of this neoconservative push to move us back to this perceived better past. That's what everyone's saying now. Everyone wants to remake the social fabric and the calls that conservatives are making are just 
first of all, unrealistic and kind of silly because instead of going toward a better past, what new sincerity postulates is that we should get better at expression. We should get better at genuinely connecting so that we can create a new future because we're not ludtards. We're not going to go back to some primitive primitivist society unless you know the whole grid gets taken out or or something like that but uh, minus a natural disaster or a crazy war happening we're going to continue moving forward into the future and so how do we handle that how do we grapple with that and when i look at the modern landscape of the publishing world today it's somewhat slip uh, excuse me it's somewhat split in terms of how people are approaching it first of all most of the works coming out today are absolute crap and one of on one side they are good in the sense that a big genre that's trying to be pushed over the last 10 years is these first person pov kind of coming of age stories or narratives like from marginalized perspectives and some of the time they can be super cringe but sometimes they're actually really great stories and they can really help you can you know to connect to the human experience and a lot of the time i get turned off by these stories because maybe they have this great storyline and a great character, but they're not really standing on the shoulders of some of the greats. Like their literary merit isn't awesome, but still they're kind of making a, 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 a genuine connection toward expression and the movement toward positivity in terms of literature. But then we have the whole cynical side. We have the people who are fueled by all of the politics and all of their fear and paranoia, and they are writing these stories. They're kind of these parables of what's going on today or examining institutions like marriage or some of these kind of fallible things like, in their opinion, gender and whatnot. And most of the time, these kind of narratives fall flat. Sometimes they don't. Sometimes you get someone who's very perceiving. A guy named Nathan Hill um, last year, five or six months ago, released a book called The Wellness. And it's a critique and kind of an examination of modern marriage. And he does a really good job. I mean, he goes as deep as a, a Wallace or, you know, an author that you would really enjoy into the idea of the modern marriage. But for every single one of those books, there's a ton that absolutely fail a very similar project. And we're trying to silence these emotions. So Wallace says, we, these people are going to treat untrendy human troubles and emotions with reverence and conviction. Because now we're just trying to numb and silence everything. You know, in Alcoholics Anonymous, you're never really supposed to ask why. You're never really supposed to go into, you know, my dad beat me up when I was six years old. It's really, how can I be better? What can I do today? Who can I surround myself with? to you know, make sure that I stay on track. The whys sometimes lead to rabbit holes that lead to triggers that send you spiraling down into further addiction. And so I get that. I love to ask why I'm kind of a wire, but in when, when we look and examine, especially the younger generations of today, as a teacher, I see this all the time. And then obviously the millennial generation, they are not asking any of the questions. They are just trying to run away from the pain like or numb themselves and hide away from any of these you know, old feelings and emotions. And this is why we see depression rates and suicide rates and all these other things increasing because in, in their self-consciousness, in this new self-consciousness everyone has, on the other side of that coin is emotion, is some of these things like boredom, even rage and hate and, and sadness and whatnot that aren't very useful to most people. And most people don't have the tools to deal with them or are in the, the environment to deal with them. To be able to really process your emotions and grow and heal trauma, you cannot be on your phone for a couple hours a day. You're going to have to be actively doing something. It's not some passive thing like, oh, it just takes time. That That's one of the biggest lies ever. Like, over time, it feels less intense. It doesn't like, you know, if you on day one of a breakup, you're all sad or whatever. And after two years, you're like, you know, screw that lady. But if you were traumatized, if that if your ex was like saying, you're never going to do anything, Johnny, you're never going to make it as a writer, go get a job as a gas station attendant, go be an accountant right now. Then if even if you break up with them, that might affect you for years. I had this ex that I was with for a while and she would tell me all those things. Ian, you're never going to do anything. You suck at speaking, get off of YouTube, like all this stuff. And like, I somewhat internalized it. And then after the relationship, I had to like work through all that. And it was a lot. And Wallace says the words reverence and conviction because he knew how to work through these things. He was a participant in Alcoholics Anonymous. One of those great, you know, one of the great moments in Infinite Jest, and this really isn't a spoiler, is that there was all these people giving speeches like in Alcoholics Anonymous. And they get up there and they tell their life story. And there's one dude who thinks he's kind of cool and he has this kind of weird story. And he gives up there and gives a presentation like I'm giving now. He speaks like this. And no one likes it. Everyone just doesn't pay attention. But then there are these two other girls and they just start speaking. They kind of put their head down and they just trauma dump and are just authentic and genuine and have conviction behind what they're saying. And everyone's crying and um, just enamored with what they're saying. But these girls aren't, you know, women aren't, you know, they're not meaning to do this. 
And Wallace makes a great point that if we tried to make this movement, if we tried to do this, we'd automatically be outdated. You know, I, I every single week, really every month, there's a new word. Like every, all my students right now are like, you're glazing, bro. Like I don't even, I haven't, like who knows what they're talking about. So this call for this slow lifestyle, for this slow productivity. I know Cal Newport just released a book called Slow Productivity. Uh, you know, calling that back into existence is going to be really hard because it's never going to catch on in the sense of trendiness and coolness. But if we kind of move into this proto-Luddite or this weird reality, it's shocking to people. I mean, as I'm sure you already know, if you are into reading and writing, people can't believe it. They're like, you sit around and read and write all day. Uh, you have all this knowledge. People feel uncomfortable when you like know more than them about things and always kind of have the answer to something and you're confident in your answer. Um, it's somewhat shocking to them. But the postmodernists were shocking people with their art. You know, They were releasing stuff that had sex and violence and all these different things. And they were accused of being anarchists and socialists and um, they, they were censored. So what can we do, though? Because today, we could obviously go really hard and get canceled, but that's that doesn't seem very appealing or very fun or very productive. And what Wallace was imagining and what he was really trying to capture with the Pale King is what if we took it the exact other direction? What if we made something so boring that became interesting? What if we confronted all the yawners, all the people? When I start lecturing you guys, like this, if I get into this mode right here or like a little bit more passionate in front of my students about the book that we are reading within a minute, if not 30 seconds, if not 20 seconds, but I'll give them a minute, 70% of the class on their phones, head downs, looking out the win looking out the window. Maybe I have 30% still listening, probably only 10%, 20% are just being kind and looking at me at least. And this has nothing to do with children. And this is the same with adults. If you go go to church and see who is actually, who's actually paying attention, most of the time, not many people are. And because we're having, there's more adult children, mo more, you know, adults have never been raised because raised is a verb. You have to get raised up into higher consciousness. Then we have this world of, you know, ha of adolescents or children running around and they are doing the rolled eyes. They're, they got the lip injections and all this stuff. They're acting, you know, like adolescents. And so then when you talk about something shocking, when you talk about something sentimental, they're going to put the irony eye on you. They're going to make fun of you. And as I talked about, that's why gatekeeping is important, that there are these transformational tools that are, you know, exist in our reality. And most of the time, society eats them up, the system eats them up, turns them into sim simulacras. And then when you try to speak about them to the common everyday citizen, they have a whole list of, um, rebuttals and jokes about that very thing so they don't have to take it seriously because the last thing they want to do is look in the mirror and have any growth themselves. And what's actually even crazier, so I'm always talking about growth, right? Growth, growth, growth. But a lot of people can get down with that, right? Like because of our ambition and competitive mindset in the West, you could tell people, hey, Johnny, you know, you need to sit down and read 100 books and do this. And uh, they might just flip a switch and be like, all right, I've seen people do this. I've done this before. You kind of tap into that competitive mindset. But when you tell people not to do anything, when you tell people just be bored, like give up, you know, give up ambition. Let's just totally cut this wire. And without drugs, without being like super weird, that that's harder than anything. And as I talked about in my Infinite Jest video and what it's about, the characters in the novel through their addiction and their ambition are really just trying to connect on this way. They're trying to move into this new sincerity. And because we've been so conditioned to stories, like sometimes I'm sure you guys do this. Sometimes you, if you go see a super generic movie, you kind of know what's going to happen. You know kind of the rise and falls and there may be a plot twist. You can kind of feel what's happening. But when you read Infinite Jest, especially for the first time, it's all it's it's broken up in terms of the into a nonlinear timeline. And so as you're reading it, it's forcing you to engage. It's forcing you to kind of get out of this typical frame of mind and meaningfully connect with the novel. You're going to have to actually read Infinite Jest if you want to get it. You're going to have to try and pay attention and figure some things out on your own or even use an online guide or whatever. But at the end of the day, it's going to be it's a much deeper experience of connection than most books because you had to work for it. And new sincerity is not dead. As I said earlier, the examination and kind of this focus on, on identity is good if it's done in the right way. And so that's something that a lot of you guys can take away from this presentation is that moving it, publishers like this, publishers like the audience to be engaged. And so if you're thinking about writing a novel or writing a novel, I know from being in the publishing world for a little bit and having a bunch of friends who are full-time authors that if you want to go, you know, spend five years writing, eight years writing the next Infinite Jest metafictional novel, it will probably get published. But if you want to make it easier on yourself and probably have more of an impact, or if that's just what you're doing anyway, you know, having these novels 
that focus on like the fragmentation of the self because of society and then the characters trying to reconnect and belong. Like that's been a classic all throughout time, but people are looking for that more than ever. And so what do you guys think of New Sincerity? Why did it fail? What can we do to revive it? Thank you guys for being here and I, and I will see you guys in the next video.